You're listening to Stephanie and Fox, where we aim to educate, enlighten, and evolve your intimacy. You can find us at stephanieandfox.com to learn more about counseling, self-study courses, and retreat services that we provide. This show contains adult content about relationships, intimacy, and sex, and is meant for those 18 years and older. Now please, sit back, listen up, and get ready to evolve your intimacy. So welcome back. So we're starting our second episode of our two-part series with Dr. Holly Richmond. We just got finished interviewing her and learned some really good stuff about childhood sexual trauma. My name is Stephanie and I am an LPC sex therapist specializing in all things sex. And I'm Fox. I'm a board certified relationship and sex coach, a sexual assault intervention specialist, and a crisis intervention specialist. And along with us, we have Sadie and Silver that are still on the line with us. And we are going to talk and process through everything we just heard. Uh, I know that we, Stephanie and I, are about to get extremely personal. Um, I hope Sadie and Silver are comfortable with doing the same. So we're going to go ahead and bring them right on and cut straight to the chase and get this started. How you guys doing? How you feeling after that that interview? We doing good? Yeah, my voice is still a little shaky. It's okay. But it was an. It was I'm a, good. I'm good. It was intense. So I want to get y'all's takeaways from it. What are some of the things that you are walking away with? And I just want to have a really in depth conversation for our listeners. And this is just going to be raw and somewhat. I don't want to mean it negatively, but just raw and down and dirty. <laughs> we are good at getting dirty. <laughs> down and dirty. Yes. <laughs> kind of want to get dirty. I'm surprised you didn't say don't. So who wants to go first? What are your takeaways? My my biggest takeaway from that is that our little theory that we've been throwing around for a long time of there's no wrong way to love. Right. Sounds like that's pretty accurate, <laughs> even from a clinical perspective. When you mean no wrong way to love, how does that? Can you there isn't that? one way. Like the, the problem I have personally is that 17% of the world's cultures practice monogamy. 17%. 83% have some other version of that. Now, we happen to live in the Western society, which happens to be within that 13%, which happens to be the majority of our population on this planet. But. That, that means that there's not just one way. Like the way we have decided in this day and age in, in America that you express love by showing sacrifice and, and control. You forget, you, 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 you give up on everybody else and you have one person sexually for the rest of your life. And there is something really beautiful about sacrifice for something like that. I, I find that within the extremes, like a, like a Shaolin Buddhist monk, um, which is like the extreme level of sacrifice and control, right? I, I see a lot of beauty in that. But the problem I've had is that that's not the only way to show love. That's not the only way to have a relationship. And as we can tell by looking at divorce rates, by looking at the rates of how many monogamous relationships have infidelity involved in it, Um, clearly we're not the only ones that struggle with that one version, that one definition of how you show love. And my takeaway from what she was saying is that there's a lot of different people out there and there's a lot of different ways to express love, to have a lifestyle, alternative lifestyles. Um, they can all work. You just have to find the person that matches up with you. Yes. You need to find that puzzle piece, right? Mm -hmm. That has the same rough edges that you might, that, that it fits together. That, that's what my takeaway was. What about you? Right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> my, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that, um, but when she broke down the word intimacy and she was like, it's into or in, into how, me. Into me, pretty much, is what mm-hmm. she broke it down to. And that survivors mm-hmm. don't want people to, to really see them. And that just floored me when she said that because you're right. I, I do, I can, I can fuck, I can have oh. sex. But it's when it gets intimate, I tend to run because I don't want people to see the real me because I'm afraid they're not going to like me. They're not going to want me. I'm damaged goods, all of that type of stuff. And so I shut down yep. and run away. Yep. Fight she, or flight. She created Fucking a whole <laughs> alternate personality, basically, to deal with that. Oh. The 
the what's her name? The sin? Is that what you're talking not about? Not sin, but we used to call the your naughty girl name some name. What was your dance name? Is uh, it my dance? Go ahead. Uh, you're gonna have to. Oh, there, <laughs> there was. It's, it's, it's Sydney, San, Sadie. It wasn't Sadie. It was something else. Anyways, she kind of created a whole different persona. Like she had a lot of issues growing up with a lot of you know all these things and her growth through therapy like her therapists have found it very interesting yeah. that she would even gravitate to something that had such a spotlight on yeah, it. Yeah, she was like to totally like dancing, fun. like modeling, like doing and you know being an actress in, in Because mainstream. it's all about my body, which yes. I I that my body was just used all the time when I was a kid. So I always was like, am I enough? So that was part of yeah, so part of her strategy was to create this other persona that would go into yes. that job. Right? Just, I dance. And, and so she was a, a very confident person that would dance. And she ran like she was the number one girl at her club for 10 plus years. She but was, I was also, I was uh, fun, <clears throat> excuse me, fun and everything. But at, at work, it was a different mode and different mindset yeah. <clears throat> versus any other time. So I took, I was that that girl. That was my way of reclaiming. Yeah, she had to create a, a second persona, and for me, my gangsta bitch persona. It was yes. I wanted to oh. meld the good things about that other persona <clears throat> in with who she really is, right? Like, mm -hmm. take that confidence that you need to get up on that pole in a in, on a stage with five hundred people staring at you. It's different, but you can't go into Walmart, right? It's different. Like that was interesting to me that uh, and felt like that's something that we needed to really focus on um, so my, that she wasn't trapped and victimized is, for the rest of her life. I didn't want to look stupid. So um, my body, I'm good with. So uh, that's what I work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And I'm fun and I can talk, but I, like you said, I had to be a totally different persona mm -hmm. when I would go to work versus home. But in all of this was a struggle because of the childhood trauma, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Without it, I don't know that she would have had these kinds of struggles. She could have lived a very different life um, had she had a better support team around her. And and for me, like I can't do anything about that past, right? But what I can do is try to make from the moment she's met me forward the life that she should have had. Always. And that's all I can do, right? And that and that's what we've been doing for the last 13 years. I agree. Sorry, that probably didn't really answer your question. No, it did. It, 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 no, absolutely. That, it absolutely did. It, it kind of registers oh, yeah. over on my side because, <clears throat> you know, with Stephanie, she's extremely thorough, well-spoken. I mean, when she is in therapy mode, there is no stopping her. She is a freight train. And when it comes to entertaining, she's the same way. She can show up to an event and capture that event and almost steal it away from a host by accident. I don't even do that. I do not do that on purpose. Please no. <laughs> but when it comes time to play, she has this overwhelming fear of getting naked, even if she wants to. Even if she's drooling or salivating over the person in front of her going, oh God, yes, I want this with them. There's this almost like tranquilizing effect where it becomes, I'm not good enough. I don't look good enough. I'm not important enough. This person doesn't really want me. This, And she starts to create this hole for her that she can bury her head in, you know, almost like a peacock. And and actually, that's what you do. You peacock. It's because they bury their heads in the sand, too. I, so. I don't think peacocks do, I think. You mean ostrich? Or ostrich. Peacocking is showing off. That's right. Peacock is showing off. Ostrich, yeah. I retreat to the bathroom and cry. I have We really are good both emotions. peacocks, Fox. We are definitely peacocks. You but guys I wouldn't are describe either one of us as an ostrich. I'm an, Hopefully. I'm an ostrich. I hope not. Peacocks. I would like the strength of legs of an ostrich. But I do. I, oh, I yeah. retreat and I cry. <laughs> and then I have really big emotions and I have to work through those. Yeah. And then I'm okay sometimes, and sometimes I'm not. It's just I I don't know when it's going to hit or how it's going to hit, mm -hmm. what's going to happen, and it's it's embarrassing. It's humiliating to we me. We call it the time. minefield. The minefield. That's the minefield. You don't know where to step, right? And you don't know where to tell someone to step because you don't know what what mind is waiting for you. So it's kind of like you got to tiptoe through that field. And do your best not to trigger those minds. And it's not always it's easy, and sometimes it happens said. by accident. Yeah. <laughs> Sadie, how do you navigate the minefield? Um, with assistance. <laughs> um, 
I'm all over the place too. I'll be in the mood and then we'll be driving there and all of a sudden I'm like, he can tell my the, my whole uh, posture, my voice, everything is totally different. I'll go silent and he's like, what's wrong? So that's how I've, we've, he's helped me through those minefields. And I, like when we first met, I was just all over the place. But with his help, I have learned how to go through those cautiously and I feel like I wouldn't be able to do those with anyone else if it wasn't for him but you you brought up something interesting Stephanie when you said <laughs> that to me um you know about you not always feeling comfortable to get naked typically that's where her comfort zone is she'll get naked just don't try to talk to her about her past or anything yeah. like that because that's where her triggers come from but there's this there's been this interesting side effect of the content that we create that I didn't anticipate that for my philosophy you know I want to make these pictures as beautiful as possible but it ended up creating this pressure for her to always feel like she has to be perfect because people have an expectation when they see her at an event that she must be flawless and I don't like that's been our new battle right like this this flawless battle doesn't there's no flawless the flawless doesn't exist it's not a reality um, people are attracted to people that are comfortable in their body, and that's really the the secret sauce. I think people people have trauma search for that. Yeah, for sure. I agree, and it's the trauma responses that we have issues with. The trauma responses are things that we don't know it's going to happen, but all of a sudden it just happens, and we're trying to figure out. Yep what the hell's going on. A trauma response is our response to the environment around us. It's what we've been taught to do. And for you, you're, you're most comfortable in your skin and you're most comfortable when, you know, it's just that alternative personality comes out and she's rocking it. For me, I feel like I am so open and vulnerable and people are going to see that I'm not, maybe not what I say I am, or I'm using air quotes, because I'm so afraid to be open and vulnerable because when, Part of my abuse was my um, mental, I had sexual as well, but the mental aspect of it where I was told at one point I would make more money on my back than I would on my feet. And I was told that at like five or six and that I would never amount to anything because I was just, I was just dumb. I was meant to be looked at and not seen. And so when I started to go to school and that was my way out of all this is I just, I just went to school. I didn't know what else to do, but I knew I didn't want to be in that environment. And as I was going to school and I would get more and more educated, I kept my mouth closed because no one wanted to hear me. And I have a hard time even today, like with the podcast or with talking to people or when people want us to come do seminars and speeches because I, I have to get out of my head of, well, no one wants to listen to me. Like what, why do they want to listen to me? Because that's part of my trauma. It's, it's the whole package of the sexual, mental, physical abuse that I went through something what you're describing sounds an awful lot like imposter syndrome as uh, well well i was always told i was never enough and all those the same things too well that but, but my i guess what i was saying is that i i think that the average experience like maya angelou on her fifth book said this is the one they're going to figure out i'm a fraud mm -hmm. okay so imposter syndrome is a motherfucker and it affects everybody and so on top of the childhood trauma making you see reality in a different way now you got to throw in just imposter syndrome on top of it and how do you get through which one's which and is it even matter in the end because the reality is it's all about the mindset you come to at the end right so yep. to me the the cause was kind of irrelevant i didn't see value into like the details of the causes what i saw value in is here's where i'm at now how do i live the best possible life i can the most successful life the happiest life that i can within this circumstances now Mm. And that's what's important with us. That was yes, the, the refocusing for us. So I, I have a question for both of you. <clears throat> so Dr. Holly had, had made a statement that sexual trauma misinforms our sexual nature, right? Uh, it's not actually truly imprinting. Um, it can imprint, but it's not a true imprint, I guess, is, is what I took away from that. So... Do you guys feel that your trauma misinformed your sexuality? And has that been a negative or positive for you? Like, how do you look at that? So for us, that lens was a big focus for us three years ago. The lens with which we look out at life, right? Yeah. Because that lens 
is all a product of our personal experiences, our own biases, our anecdotal evidence of how the world works. That's not necessarily accurate. And what's interesting to me going through this process was that her and I lived a largely identical life. Now, my, my professional career is definitely a lot different than hers, but when it came to just our regular life, yeah. we were in the same place, same boat, same everything, yet we had two very different views of the reality that we were both living. Yeah. And it put me on this path of realizing that reality is bullshit, that perspective is keen, mm. that reality is really just a construct of your brain putting together light and sound signals in some fashion to help you figure out what's happening around you. And we are all susceptible to our own biases and our own personal experiences on how we translate those signals, right? So the reality is that there is no reality. I know it sounds like maybe a little too much of a, of a conversation for this podcast, but there is no reality. So, so per perspective is king and that's where mindset perspective is where we focus 100%. Yeah. changing recognizing how our lens works so that we know hey our lens is a little distorted over on this side right so i'm not going to take that left lower side of that lens for for fact i know that in that part of my lens in my life i'm going to always skew a little one way or the other and if i know that's how i work then i can operate with under those circumstances and that's pretty much what we've been doing for the last few years yes yeah so really you hit it right on the head in my opinion so there <clears throat> there's something that we when we teach combatives is is put on your warrior lens or combat lens people call it different yep. things but really that that teaching is your reality is how you adapt to your surrounding it's it's you know it's yep. it's not it's 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 almost surreal in nature because I know operators that literally will tell you when I get deployed in a combat situation, it's a video game for me. All their muscle memory and their skills are there, but mentally in their brain, it's not even real. It's almost like a video game and that's how they deal with that combat reality or being in that situation. I've heard other guys say, nope. I create it's as raw as possible to me. I smell everything, I see everything, I hear everything. I, I allow everything to come in and that's how they deal with their reality. So, you know, <clears throat> it's it's that that lens that you're talking about that truly creates our reality and the reality in itself is surreal. It's how real is your reality because you can change it thought to thought, second to second, minute to minute. Well, I think that has a lot to do with perspective, yep. not necessarily reality, because the reality is what's really happening, but our perspective of what's really happening can be skewed and what can be mis... Right. Yeah, that's probably what, a better way of How do you it. define what's really happening? How do you <clears throat> define that? Because if you look at, if we get, I mean, really mm -hmm. deep here on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, subatomic particles act differently when you're looking at them and when you're not. When they're being observed, they, they mm -hmm. act differently. Right. So theoretically, that chair behind you right now, Stephanie, when no one's looking, could turn into a vase. And we just don't know it because no one's looked at it. So if that's if that's physics and that's quantum physical law, then what's reality exactly? What is, what is that? Because I don't know. Do you do you know? Because it's all about what per, where the fucking observer is, what reality is. It's the so perception. it's bullshit. Perspective is king. Exactly. Fuck, fuck reality. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And, and your perspective is going to be different than somebody else's. So you can be, you can, we could all be sitting here in this, in our, you guys in your office, ours, us in our office, you see us, we see you. But if someone were to walk through this door right now and do something to me, you're going to tell a different side of the story then he's gonna tell, and I'm gonna tell a, right. a completely different side, and it's because of our perspective. We're all sitting in different places, we all see different things. And I think as we grow in childhood sexual trauma survivors, our perception is so skewed based off the fact that we think everybody's gonna hurt us. Everybody's out to get us. Is no that, one's yep. here to help. Is that yep. because, so another thing that Stephanie has taught me a lot about is filters. We, we all have filters that we receive information from and we output information through 
because of our experiences and the life that we have led. And if you can take just a second to remember, I have filters, she has filters, or they have filters, whoever you're having that conversation with, um, it really puts empathy and understanding in, into perspective. Mm-hmm. It, it really does. Uh, you know, when I, when Stephanie and I first got together, I was very stoic in my conversations, my face, uh, how I treated people, how I was around them, etc. because I was always looking for the safe space. I was always looking to see who's trying to hurt us. What's your angle? What bullshit are you going to bring our way? I, I, I was trapped in that protector mode, uh, you know, in that warrior type headspace. And I didn't like it. You know, in, I, I expressed to people that I loved it and I loved being this way. But internally and when Stephanie and I were alone, I, I had this thriving thing wanting me to be social with everybody and be friends with everyone and almost be like this hippie who didn't give a shit what was going on around me. And while that's not realistic for me to believe that that's going to happen 100%, um, I have been able to adapt and become more social through the understanding of our filters and how I perceive things and things I've been through. And just giving people the the common respect of, hey, this is an individual, they've lived a certain life and, and just by me giving them that respect and understanding, it, it's helped me become a lot more social around people in general. Ladies, are you ready to take your intimacy to the next level? Head over to our website to find out about relationship, intimacy, and sex counseling. And gentlemen, are you needing a little bit more? Join us at stephanieandfox.com to learn tips on how to communicate with that special someone and ignite that flame. Now, let's get back to the show. I am going to step out and say this about Sadie and I. And I'm going to leave Silver out of this because your abuse (laughs) has a different nature, right? Um, Sadie and I, we, it it was, for me, I feel like it was, it was more frequent, more, I mean, it it was more frequent. I'm just trying to be nice and say it, but I feel like it was, it was very barbaric in nature. Just, they came in, they took what they wanted. We weren't allowed to say anything. We were just supposed to give it, to give it, get to give it up. And I know that for me and and Sadie, I'm going to speak for you too. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Being able to take a step back and breathe and, and gather ourselves and say, okay, I can do this. I can, I can go out and I can face people or I can stand up in front of people or I can go and dance on that pole. That takes more strength and more courage than the average person can ever tell because we were so conditioned in our life that we were not going to be anything. We were not, we were worthless. We were, yep. we were never going to be enough yep. for anybody. And then you two came along and you're like, no, you are, you are worth something. You are enough to me. And it's just that I'm having your support <laughs> And, I'm, and like I said, I'm speaking for Sadie, so correct me if I'm wrong, but having that support from you two gentlemen is overwhelming in the beginning because we don't even know how to accept it, and we freeze. Yeah, I wanted to be safe. So as soon as I met him or heard his voice, it was it felt safe, so I knew I was in a good place. Mm-hmm. And that I've never felt like that ever. So that was very scary. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know if I was going to be good enough or he was going to leave, leave me. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to ride this fucking thing out. And if it doesn't work, then fuck, I had a really good fucking time. If it does, then, hey, <laughs> I'm excited. Let's do this. So I I was felt a little more safe. But everywhere else, no. No, yeah. never. Yeah, it was always just a survival. That's one thing that I would, I kind of got off a tangent, but what I was going with this whole thing, and then I just remembered, you know, ADHD moment. Um I'm a master at changing and adaption, adapting. I can adapt to anything. You can put me with millionaires and I'm gonna adapt. You can put me with the homeless and I'm going to adapt my personality and I'm going to fit in and find something in common with everybody. And I feel like that is a product of my childhood sexual abuse because I had to adapt to overcome and I had to change 
So I, yes. I was always trying to find tactics to avoid being abused. I was the same way. Yeah. I call that being a social chameleon. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. When you can blend in with any kind of social groups, like I, that's an essential skill for my, my hospitality industry. Um, and I see her do that as well. And it sounds like you is a strategy you, you utilize also. I think it, and I utilize it because for so long I didn't like who I was. And so I just wanted to become anybody else and I assimilated right. to whoever was around me. Yep. Mm. Dancing helped me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> One, another thing that kind of hit home for me is when she said that guilt is I made a mistake, shame is I am a mistake. And that hit home mm -hmm. for me. How about for you guys? Absolutely. Very much so. Like, that's the struggle because I struggled with this by myself. I didn't tell anybody about this until I was 18. Mm. Um, and and I didn't even know if I was supposed to be struggling. I didn't know if this was what I was supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. if this was what everyone was doing, because I can say that it was two specific babysitters, but I would be lying if I wasn't also saying that the apartment building behind my house as a child in elementary school had full of kids that were all building forts. And inside those forts, they were all naked playing with each other doing stuff like all of them i didn't know any kids that that didn't have some aspect of this going on and i was gonna i meant to ask her i was like i don't know if our generation was like where the sexual abuse peaked and it's been going down i don't know if it peaked before us i don't know where it was we should definitely ask her that on the part latchkey two at some kids. point like the, because of the latchkey that's yeah. what i kind of attributed this to latchkey kids you know because there was that generation where moms were at work and there's a whole generation of kids that went home by themselves mm -hmm. and it gave opportunity for a predator to take advantage. And I don't know if that's what created the scenario. Like there's probably a bunch of unrelated things that are affecting this that we have no idea about. Um, thanks to the book Freakonomics, I realized that there's a lot of connections between things that you wouldn't see right away without the study of the data. Um, and I don't know what it is for this case, but I, I went off on a tangent. It's okay. We're, we're, we go off on tangents. I do want to also say that not all early childhood sexualization is abuse. And I say this with caution right. and just hear me out. I have a client who, a, yeah. yeah, I have a client who um, at a very young age, he was um, molested by his uncle, which in his culture, it's a, it was a friend, but he called him an uncle. His uncle was about 10 years older than him. And so he was of age and, and of course my client was not. I think it was like five or six and 16 or something like that. It was a pretty big age difference. But my client does not see that as a negative experience or abuse because he sees that as a learning experience and his sexual debut. So when he was going to other counselors, they were saying, well, you know, it's because of your abuse. And he was trying to explain to him, no, I don't feel abused. I'm, this wasn't a negative thing for me. Um, I see this as a very positive thing because I learned this, this, and this from it. So that's one thing that I, I had to take a step back a on person. because not every, not all abuse is terrible in everybody's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so, Agreed. but for me, for me, it was terrible. I'm not going to lie. It was <clears throat> fucking horrible. And you just nailed why I struggled with it because I, it, there's this weird, like there's definitely the very early one. Um, that that had a lot more damage carried with it than when I was in sixth grade and she was a senior in high school. And it was like the last part of me, cause I did uh, younger siblings and like, that's why we still had babysitters at that time. And that was our last babysitter we ever had. Um, now the sixth grade experience was a lot different than the, when I was in first grade. Mm -hmm. um, like I, she utilized milk to make me do stuff to her. And still to this day, that can give me, it doesn't give me a negative feeling, but it gives me a feeling. Yeah. Couldn't really describe it. It's definitely not negative. It's not positive, but it there is some visceral response to seeing when a like a model pours milk on her, um, which is interesting. So I kind of have struggled with this as well, kind of coming to some sort, like I said, there's some philosophies in, in therapy circles about childhood trauma, about them owning what happened to them and like kind of owning their sexuality, which is what I kind of did. And I know that it, in therapy circles, that can be a bit controversial. 
Um, and it sounds like the guy you're talking about did the exact same thing where it was like, okay, this is, I'm a sexual person. This was part of my education. Mm-hmm. It started younger than it should have. I don't know that it's really made a significant impact. Maybe it has. Maybe the white knight syndrome comes from that experience as a kid. I don't know. But I've got a grip on my white knight syndrome, which was really all that was important to me. Where it came from, I didn't really know. But walking into relationships to try to fix people was not a positive. What do you mean by white knight syndrome? Can you explain that to us? Um, so my therapist talk. So there's that? yeah, so there's this thing. I, I'm guessing it's called white knight syndrome. So this thing, which probably stems from feeling like a victim at a very young age, where I fail the need to defend those that can't defend themselves. Um, I have intervened so many times over the course of my lifetime, I have lost count. I had to learn martial arts because of my desire to step in front of bullies to stop them from beating up people. This started, my first fight to defend somebody was in uh, second grade, defending a kid who was uh, African American being teased by two older white kids at the park. And that that situation could have gone really poorly for me. It didn't, but it could have. And that was a little scary to me. So that 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 same year, right after that, I started on my martial arts thing. And over the years, I have ended up in relationships with I don't search out damaged people, but I think because of where I am sexually, that it tended to put me in the streams with people that had a lot of sexual trauma in their past. And that was not necessarily a recipe for happiness for me. Mm. I, it's, I cannot fix anybody, right? I, I, it's not my responsibility to, to do that. I had to get to a place where I had to stop trying to save everyone. And because it was a problem and it was a problem in a lot of weird ways, like helping a girl out with a situation that had nothing to do sexually, but would be a violation to the girl I was dating at that time. Like stuff like that, that I wouldn't have expected, so to speak. You know, it's interesting because <clears throat> as you're talking, Silver, you're you're telling my story just in a different variation. So <clears throat> I grew up, I was I was picked on by the band geeks. I was the smallest. I was afraid of everything, everybody. Um, I mean it was it was bad. It was very bad. And it wasn't until the second year of my or the third year of my high school career I moved from California to New York. And in New York, I met a different type of high school experience because I was the kid from California. I was the the California beach surfing bum. Uh, Look at how cool this guy is. And I was the only Californian they had ever met. Um, I went to high school on Long Island, New York in, in Hempstead. And so it was predominantly black and Hispanic. And... Even though I'm Hispanic and Sicilian, I look I look white. Period. When people meet me, it's there in their minds. There's no question. So when I tell them I'm Hispanic and Sicilian, they look at me very weird and they get like, "Are you kidding?" I'm like, "No, yeah, this is what I am." Um, and I think my process was somewhat of the same. Where after the military changed my life, my decision to join the military was at one out of necessity not necessarily desire at the time. And that quickly changed to desire. And then, you know, I got into martial arts. I became a military cop. I started buttoning in and protecting people. Uh, I called it the broken bird syndrome, where I always, I was that broken bird. The military changed that. And so if not me, then who it is, a, mm. a, is a famous quote by an actual friend of mine who was killed, uh, and he said, if not us, then who? If we are not the men and women to step up, then who the hell else is going to do it? And I took that, and and I buried it deep into my heart, and and I've always lived that way, um, almost to the point where it would get me in trouble sometimes, because I I had such a strong response to bullies and people picking on people and, and... I always go for the weaker individual because the hell with you, I was that. Yep. And because I'm not that anymore, I almost feel this, uh, what's the word? 
Empowered. This not empowered. This this relief. Not even no. Not a relief. It's it's almost like a mandatory call oh. of duty. Like if I don't do this, I feel like shit. If I don't protect yeah. someone, I feel I, I I look at myself and I go, what the hell? Why didn't you do something about it? You know. So it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> One of the other things that kind of. I didn't kind of, it really hit home for me, was how hearing your story and how you negotiate everything, not negotiate, but how you you plan it out, um, everything is 100%. She has no, there's no guesses. There's no questions. You answer all of the questions before it goes into it. So there's, everything is right out in front. Everything is in the open. And that's powerful for me to hear because there are times where I don't know what we're walking into and that scares me but yeah I, I can be unstructured that way a little yes, bit yes or, or <clears throat> I, I have a lot of securities built in but I don't talk to her about it and I think that's where the downfall yeah. is sometimes is I don't ex- fully explain everything I've done to make sure the situation is safe yeah right and, because you don't necessarily want her to know that <clears throat> yeah I've got you know, we're meeting somebody I've never met before. Yeah, he's got great testimonials, but I can't guarantee that that's all going to still play out. Right. So, yeah, I've, I've got my CCW. Yeah, I do have a nine on me. Yeah, there's another one in that bag. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, you have to plan for the contingencies. I would rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it, right? Absolutely. So there's a lot of those things I may not share with her because that changes the whole experience for her. That's not her concern, right? That right. shouldn't be her concern. Her concern should just be having fun. My concern is analyzing every inch of the body language I've, of the of the me doing the pre-interview, which they don't realize is a pre-interview when I before they even meet her. Yeah. They have to go through me first, and they meet me outside of wherever we're going to be meeting. So it's at the parking lot of the hotel or what have you. Um, I do that, and I purposely get a feel for them, see whether where their eye contact is at, see if I, I get any sort of shady vibe and I have no fucking problem walking away right then should I have had that feeling. Um, and we have walked away from situations in the past. Uh, it's not something I typically have to do because my pre-interview process has gotten so good um, and, and really analyzing the way, like, the way guys do their, their profiles. You know what I mean? You can see the, the shady shit through the way they write their profile because you can just see where they're at. So if you start getting good at that, like that's what I did, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she has to know all that stuff, right? And it's not about keeping something from her. It's about what I've been doing for a living for 20 years. I'm creating an environment for her, right? I specifically mold environments to create a specific emotional response for a living. I've made millions doing that. So. Why the fuck wouldn't I use those same skill set to create these incredible nights for her that take months of groundwork to lay into it, right? Mm -hmm. So that it it, it boils up to this precipice, this ultimate climax of this situation, whatever that might be. And then it's the reclaiming and then it's the months of talking about that night that it's, it's six months. It's the three months before and the three months after that these nights end up encompassing for us. And that's just like our style, how we came across this because of all the things we've just talked about tonight. We set up like our trips and it's all planned out. We have, you know, he's vetted the guys even before. Like it doesn't always work out. And it doesn't always. But when it does, man, it's been pretty awesome ride. Yes. But that takes an extreme amount of trust Mm -hmm. on her part. Mm -hmm. And, Uh and I mean, on mine as well. And with, my type of situation coming out of just my whole life. I was married to a man who was extremely narcissistic. I mean, I teeter between sociopath, psychopath, like, I mean, legitimately. He was a piece of shit. My best friend, when I would go to work on Mondays, she would hug me and she told me years later that she did that because she'd never thought, she never knew when I was going to die over the weekend and not come back to work. He was going to kill me. And so just hearing all that, I mean, I just have all of that. So the trust for me is very hard to give and I'm learning to let go of that and try to give him more trust but yeah that's that that to me is the biggest piece that I'm having yeah and and I want to talk to anyone that's listening because there's there's multiple levels here right there's 
<clears throat> those with sexual trauma need to feel safe and in a controlled environment. Those of us that love them, that are trying to create that safe environment, you have to determine how much information you give to your partner and how much information you don't because Silver hit it right on the key. You want to create that very sexy and safe environment, but each individual is different and what they need from you is different. So, you know, I am very big on my past, my skill set, what I'm capable of. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll paint a quick picture. So, <clears throat> her very first play date with a single guy, you know, uh, I called him, I got all his information. We had been talking to him for months, flirting back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> I gave him a set of instructions. Uh, I made him pull out in front of our, you know, into our driveway so I could, on our cameras, I could capture his license plate. Um, I had my buddy right around the corner who is law enforcement. Um, you know, he was ready at, at the drop of a dime to kick the door in. I had all the cameras in the house on, and I told the guy, play will only happen in the living room where I can see you on camera. Uh, <clears throat> and then as soon as he pulled up, I had his, you know, I ran his plates to make sure the plates came back to him. He wasn't renting a car. I mean, I was looking for any clue. <laughs> oh, yeah, because that happens. Dude, no joke. That's a full-on operation. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, but she knew none of this. Mm -mm. All she was told is, she said, hey, you're gone in California. I'm fucking horny. Now, Matt, that's not even how that went down. Yeah, you, something about that. No, no, it is, how do well, you want me? <laughs> but no, but no, it is. Because, no, you were like, I'm setting this up. You said you're going to go home, and it was already set up. But you had mentioned, anyway. <clears throat> we, we can go over the, those details. Okay, but, but yeah, just keep going. That, that's how I remember it. Um, so these, I put all this into effect. I also, you know, yeah, reading through his profile, but then I, I contacted other people. I said, hey, I'm going to contact your references. Are you going to be okay with that? And let them know I'm going to be contacting them. Uh, you know, and so all of this goes into that one single solitary event. event. Experience. You know, uh, and, and I guess that sometimes as protectors, we can assume because we're good at what we do that that, that should be enough. But, but it, it's not always. We need to, you really need to ask your partner, how much of this do you really want to know? And let them determine how much information they're provided. And that may adapt and change constantly because the first time they may love it, the second time they may go, you know what? Now that I know you're doing all that, I don't want to know because that takes the sexy away from it. But constantly, and I'm going to start doing this because I just assume that Stephanie trusts me. She knows my past. She knows what I've been through. So I assume she knows I will handle anything that comes up no matter what. Yeah. But that's an assumption. And well, it's because you know the striker's <clears throat> chance, right? Right. The, yeah. Fucking the worst fighter in the world could <clears throat> line up on my, uh, Mike Tyson and just land that one lucky punch. Get that lucky. Is that guy a better fighter than Mike Tyson? Fuck no. Yeah. But did Mike Tyson get knocked out still? Yes. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Yes, it can did. fucking happen. I've seen it happen. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But, but so yeah, so I just want to throw that out there is, as we're having this raw conversation, make sure that you're securing the situation, you're creating that safe and sexy environment, but also make sure your partner is involved at whatever level they're comfortable with, with being involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. I would absolutely I know agree. for us, like, uh, Sadie's gone through her whole life with guys that wanted to be tough guys. Yeah. That weren't tough guys. Yeah. And that, that, that little man insecure syndrome kind of thing, which can breed a lot of anxiety oh. in the partner because that guy is constantly thinking there's threats everywhere, right? Well, he would tell and me. He's talking tough, but it's all facade, it's all puffery. So there's no real confidence behind any of it, which I felt she has always noticed. And then the difference between her past and me is that I am very much a man that takes care of business and I had to take care of business with her real early with her ex like real early like 
I took care of that shit so hard that he wouldn't look me in the <laughs> eye for 10 years. And now he's at a place, actually, we have a much better relationship now than we ever did. Um, and, and it, but it took that, that, that uh, being a real tough guy that actually really can handle shit for her to calm down. And to be honest with you, she kind of finds it sexy. So I don't necessarily keep stuff from her, but what she likes to know is that, yeah, shit can get handled. It'll be handled if it needs to be. And yeah. she's seen it happen. And then I also know that if I'm going to get in a fight with two guys, that she has no problem jumping on the back of the second. Hell no. So. My, and see, I've gotten in trouble about that. But yes. don't fuck with me or my family or yeah. my husband because so, I will attack you. It's a real ride or die <laughs> couple here. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the security OPSEC, you know, is real, real important for us. We, we talk mm -hmm. about things that have nothing to do necessarily with a specific occurrence, but with general, you mm -hmm. know, this is the exit. We have to always be looking at exits constantly. This, you know, you're military. All your buddies do the exact same shit. So my friends and relatives that are military have taught me these these protocols, and I apply them religiously. Um, and that's why I don't necessarily have to have each time the the security conversation with her because we already know what what's going to happen if shit yeah. goes sideways. Right. But what we Fine. I very rarely is it ever been a bad situation. Like fine, like physically dangerous. No. What happens way more often is dudes that can't perform. Oh, I hate that. that. And I feel so inadequate. Way more than anything else. I feel so yeah. inadequate when that happens, and I feel like it's me. Yes, and that's what Did I. Do you feel it's crying. your fault? Yes. But, yes. And by the way, yeah. the guy thinks it's his fault, and no one's talking, so nothing yep. gets better. That yes. fucking happens so much. Yes. Communication. That has landed me to, in the bathroom crying so many times. So many times. Yep. Well, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about that real quick. Is you know wrapping this back into sexual trauma. If you do not communicate. No words are being spoken. Nothing's being heard. No understanding is happening. It's it's, it's impossible. Everyone thinks it's their fault. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then everyone leaves with a bad taste, and no one understands really what happened. Exactly. <laughs> right. Everyone was having a conversation around the real conversation instead of the actual conversation. Yeah. You know, another thing that we haven't talked about yet is it is okay. So, so another thing that Stephanie has taught me a lot about is giving permission. And that doesn't mean that anyone's controlled. But with people with sexual trauma, sometimes they have to be given permission and told it's okay to like the things you want sexually. It's okay to still be sexual. It's okay to do role play around what happened to you because you think it's hot. These things are okay. And here's your permission to do it. Here's your platform to do it. And when that happens, sometimes you see tremendous growth in that single or that singular event because it's almost a relief their their expression their body just lets go and they go wait a minute i'm allowed mm. oh shit i'm allowed this is okay there's not there's something wrong with me you know and it almost releases that stigma away from them and that could be a very powerful very powerful thing We've been told so much that we're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do this. I know in my relationship, yeah. I mean, not necessarily my childhood trauma, but in my relationship is, was you have to do it this way. You can't do it that way. You know, and it's, and that still played in from my trauma from my childhood because again, I'm still not fucking good enough. And so mm -hmm. that whole, I'm not enough. I got to do more. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And being told when he told me that, you know, it's okay. I battle myself. I have to battle myself of, okay, first off, don't find the drama in this situation. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be excited about this. He's not going to get mad if you enjoy this. And it's just one thing after another where I'm just like, bam, bam, bam. And by the time the act finally happens, I'm exhausted because I've already been battling myself. I'm tired, ready to go to bed. And <laughs> so it's, it's, and people don't see that. People don't see the inner struggles that we go through just to get ready and go to a fucking event and what we have to go through just to, yep. to be sexy. And I want yeah. to encourage everybody listening to have grace with other people, have some compassion, have empathy. It's not that you're not sexy. It's not that we don't want to fuck you. It's not that you're not amazing. It's that we have something going on in us in that moment where we just physically can't. Women have had an unfair 
shake with all of this for generations. Sorry. No, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you, you guys are struggling with, you know, should I be sexual or is that a bad thing if I'm sexual? Like, you not, you don't know where the fuck you're supposed to be because there's been hundreds of years of mixed signals, mixed information. Mm-hmm. Look at something as simple as prostitution, uh-huh. right? Prostitution in the foundations of our country was a huge part of how they settled the West. That's how they did the railroads. When the, they were spreading West with the rail, they put a saloon in, they put a post office and a fucking brothel yep. that moved all the way across the whole West um, till, till it got to the coast. And you know who owned those brothels? Women. And those women started becoming very powerful. They started exercising a voice in politics, which they'd never had before. Why is it that all that shit was legal until they hit the fucking coast? And as soon as they didn't need it anymore, now we have to make that illegal, right? Why is it always one service that's specifically not allowed to be sold that pretty much targets women? Why is why all these laws seem to be targeting women from making money? Look at Twitch right now. There are these girls that are making a lot of money on Twitch, which is a pl- platform for video gamers, mm-hmm. where they sit in a hot tub in a bikini and play video games. They just de-platformed a girl who was making six figures a month off of her of her Twitch with no explanation. Yeah. If I started a Twitch and I played my video games in my fucking hot tub topless, do you really think they're gonna de-platform me? Right. No. But why are they doing it to women? Like, this has been going on forever. And how do you women process this? Hundreds of years of being kept down where we men want you to be sexual, but not too sexual where it makes us uncomfortable, (laughs) right? So you can be sexual, just not too sexual. You can be pretty, just not too pretty. You can have a voice, just not too loud. You can make money, just not too much. (laughs) Fuck that. Fuck that. It's you, bullshit. you know, it's because and as it all much, goes through, not just <clears throat> this, this goes through lifestyle, goes through everything. Yeah, as much as society pretends that it still doesn't stigmatize and sexualize women's sexuality and women's looks, it really, it very much still does. Period. I mean, it very 100%. much still does. It's it's prevalent in commercials, in, in I mean, everything. Out, look at marketing in general out there. You know, <clears throat> we do counseling and coaching and workshops. Our marketing almost has to be sexual based to, for us to get any traction. Yeah. It really does. Yep. Sex sells, period. And sex with women sells. That is the dominant force in marketing across the board. But we can sell it in that aspect. <clears throat> we can we can be beautiful to look at. We can do all of that stuff. Right. But... It's got to be for the men only. We can't do it for ourselves. You could be sexy to sell a car, but don't you dare be sexy to make yourself some money. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> it's that dichotomy that gets me every time. So as we're closing That's up. Bullshit, and we got to change it. We are going <laughs> to change it. And I'm hoping that this conversation yep. and our this, this two-part podcast really helps people understand that we are all fucked up in some way, some mm. shape or form. Mm-hmm. Some of us a little bit more than others. Some of us have that childhood sexual trauma. Some of us have got these horrible relationships in our past where we've just not been able to do anything right. And at the end of the day, we are all in this lifestyle to have a good time, to enjoy each other, to appreciate sex of all kinds, and just to fucking live our lives. So if something happens at an event or if something happens at in an experience or at a playtime, it's okay. It's okay for shit to happen. It's okay for things to go wrong. It's okay to talk about it, and it's okay to try again. Yeah, we all, you know, another thing, I a trend I've been seeing is there's a lot of profiles and people that claim they want friendships. But the minute something goes wrong, they genocide, and they cast out the, that couple or that individual or what have you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not friendship. That is not loyalty. And no. that is not the type of community that we're trying to build. We're trying to build a community that says, hey, you need help? Here's my hand. Come here. I will help you. Yep. <clears throat> Something went wrong tonight? Hey, everyone pause. Something's going on with Stephanie. Let's all come together as a friend and family. 
Let's figure this out. Even if it means no sex it's tonight. It's an intimate thing. So. Yeah, it's a very personal thing. But a lot of people claim mm-hmm. that. A lot of people claim it. And, right. and just like Silver was saying earlier, where at events you see certain things happen, that shit does happen. And people like to claim and, and do this thing, oh, no, we're, we're strong. We're this powerful community. We're this. Yes, we are. And we have better communicative skills than monogamous the monogamous community does. However, we still have things mm-hmm. that are broken in this community that need to be fixed. We still have things that we need to take a hard look at and be honest with our community and go, hey, why are there two point something million profiles that say they want friendship inside and outside the bedroom, but you don't actually act like yeah. friends? I'm sorry, that's not yeah. a friendship. You know, I know that's what yeah. Stephanie and I do. We're very serious about friendships. We're very serious about, hey, every time we hang out doesn't have to equal someone's dick getting sucked or yes. boobs coming out or whatever. We can have a conversation and be around our kids and have a barbecue. And, and you know, if flirting happens, it happens. I mean, I'm going to grab your tits and ass. That's just, I'm going to do prob- that. You probably will. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's we can talk about everyday life and it doesn't always have to be around sex Mm -hmm. because we actually want to get to know you who you are as people period my wife has this we're already getting intimate (laughs) yeah well and it just makes if you're going to be sexual it makes it stronger and better and more powerful if you have something in common you have a connection with the person you're being sexual with if you give a fuck about who people are, the fucking is better. There you go. Put that on a t-shirt. 100%. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we're wrapping up, guys, I want to thank you for honest <laughs> communication with us, being open about your stories. I know. Being raw. Being raw. This is not yeah. an easy topic to talk about. And Sadie, I know you, right now I'm just looking at you and you're so much more relaxed than when we first started. And I feel like <laughs> after you've shared your story and it's all over whew, and you can take a breath, that <laughs> you're going to do so much good in the community just by sharing your story. And and and, and hearing a male voice is powerful. We mm-hmm. very rarely hear a man say, I was sexually abused as a child and here's my story. Right. And that is, I think, more powerful than anything because I, hopefully I want men to come forward and start acknowledging that shit happens with them. And you know what? Maybe that's what's causing them some issues. And if it is, don't be afraid to get help. Reach out to us. We can um, we do the coaching. We do the counseling. If we're not in your area and you have some deep counseling that needs to be done, we can help you find people in your area that will work with you. And don't be afraid. Don't sit there in silence and suffer. You don't have to do that anymore. For us, like if there's one last takeaway we hope that someone can take from all of this is that we, like you said, we all are broken in some way. We all have our little kinks that we're into. And we should be able to have a space to express that and not be ashamed of who we are and what we like, as long as it's not hurting other people and everything's consensual. Um, that there is somebody for every flavor. And that's one thing being in this industry for so long or being within the community for so long that there really is something for everyone. Mm-hmm. Whatever way you swag, there is another tribe that does it the same way. And you should be able to find them. And mm-hmm. you can't find them until you're comfortable enough to say, hey, I am here. This is me. Where are the rest of the people like me? If you're pretending to be someone else and pretending to fly under the radar, and to fit into a mold that of expectations that everyone else around has of you, that's a recipe for sadness. That's a recipe for regret. Mm. That's a recipe that is very difficult to lead to a happy life. Mm. You can't do that without being free to be yourself. And we struggle. We struggle at this. And we've been doing this uh, separately for two, 20 years, but yeah. together for 13. And if anyone sees us as the seasoned swingers or what have you, we struggle at times (laughs) and we don't know when it's always going to happen. And it's okay. It's okay that you sometimes struggle. It's okay that you were in the mood and now maybe the situation has changed and now you're not. Like all of these things are okay. And we need to just have a space for which we can all communicate this. 
And that's it. That's what we want. It's a great, that's a great message. Yeah, it is. Well, tell everybody where they can find you. You can find us, Sadie and Silver, on um, Facebook. You can find us, Sadie Loves Silver, on Instagram. Perfect. Well, thank awesome. you guys for sharing your story. And again, I want to remind all of our listeners, if you are struggling, don't hesitate to reach out. There's help out there. You don't have to do this alone. And we have a platform. You can check us out at stephanieandfox.com where you can get in touch with us. We can put you in touch with other people if we need to. There's a community here that will work with you and will help you, and you're not fighting this fight alone. That's right. Absolutely. You are not in this alone. And it's okay. We are your battle buddies. We got your six. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you guys again. And uh, have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to our show. And remember, you are not in this alone, and we are here to help. You can check us out at stephanieandfox.com and subscribe to all of our social media accounts to get free resources about evolving your intimacy. Have a good night. Have a good one.